I'm Imran Ahmed, founder and CEO of the Business of Fashion, and welcome to Drive, BOF's new podcast series delivered by DHL, where we hear the stories of fashion's most dynamic entrepreneurs in their own words. Today, I sit down with the legendary designer Diane von Furstenberg. But Diane's much more than a designer. She's been an entrepreneur since she came up with the idea for her iconic wrap dress from the very beginning. Fashion was not my thing. My thing was, I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I knew the kind of woman I wanted to be. I wanted to be a woman in charge. No, I knew it was a good dress because it had an attitude. But did I know that I would sell more than 10 millions of it? No. So here's my conversation with Diane von Furstenberg to learn what it really takes to build a global fashion business from scratch. Diane von Furstenberg, thank you for taking the time to sit down with me. We're sitting here in a suite at Claridge's covered in your iconic prints. So we're kind of in, the, in a living space that you really feel the brand and the person, Dion von Furstenberg. And I, I want to spend today talking to you a little bit about your journey of how, how you got here. And I want to start right at the beginning, actually, even before the business existed. A big part of what you know, makes people driven to, to create businesses is something that comes from the inside. And I, I wanted to know, like, what, what were you like growing up? Well, I think if, if you go that deep into, I mean, it is true, like the early part of any biography is the only really interesting one, right? So you have to go prior to my birth, and you have to go back to occupied Belgium, but occupied German Belgium. And there's this young woman, young girl, 22 years old, doing resistance. She gets arrested. She goes to she gets arrested, goes to prison outside of, of, of Brussels in Malines. And uh, they she says, No, I am I am Jewish because she's so afraid to be she's so afraid to be tortured. She said, I don't know anything, I don't have any papers but uh, I'm Jewish, and the woman who interrogated said, don't say you're Jewish because they're going to ship you out. And anyway, she gets shipped into Auschwitz, and uh, it's May 1944, and for the next 13 months, she will be in three concentration camp. And at the end, when she's liberated, she weighs 49 pounds, and she can barely move yet. When we found the the questionnaire that she answered, you know, that she had to fill when they liberated her, see the name, the first name, uh, a st- state of health, and she write excellent health. This is your mother. And yes, I was just gonna go and big up. She comes back to Belgium. Her fiance comes back. They meet, and uh, they they get married. But the doctor says you can absolutely not have a child for at least three to five years because you won't survive and the child will not be normal. And nine months later, I'm born and I'm not normal. <laughs> okay, so so your story, you say, begins before birth. And do you feel like because of this incredibly harrowing experience that your mother survived and, and lived through, yes. it shaped you? Completely, because my mother said, God saved me so that I can give you life by giving You life, you gave me my life back. You are my torch of freedom. So as a little girl, I was given this heavy torch. And maybe for a little girl, it's a little difficult, but that that's what she gave me. And her bigger, the biggest gift she gave me is that fear is not an option. Do you remember, you know, with that kind of expectation or that mantle placed upon you how did that manifest itself in like the way you were with other people or the way you were in school or the things you were interested in I was you know in I, I, I grew up in Belgium I had very dark curly hair and everyone in my class was blonde with very straight hair so I felt very alien and I felt very different 
and I didn't like it really. So I didn't feel I belonged there. So, so very early on, I had to rely on myself. And then I, another thing that I, I think was very important is that I was used to play a lot in front of my mother in her big vanity. She had a big mirror. And it's not that I liked the way I look, because I didn't, but I liked the power that I had over that image. If I did a face, she did a face. If I moved, she would. And so that's when I really realized that how much control you have over yourself. Right. And when did the interest in fashion first come? I didn't, I did not. I mean, fashion was not my, my, my thing. My thing was, I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I knew the kind of woman I wanted to be. I wanted to be a woman in charge. I wanted to be a woman, you know, who's in charge of her destiny, of, of everything, who could pay her bills. I wanted to be an independent woman. That is for sure. I used to write short stories, and I was always the mistress. I was not the wife, you know. <laughs> I was, I was the, the, the mysterious woman who who was in charge of her own life. That's what I wanted. And then when you start in life, there are all these doors, you know, and one door is your door. And my door happened to be this um, Italian manufacturer. I had a printing plant in Italy. And uh, I never in a thousand years when I first went there did I think that was going to be the most important thing in my life. That was the door. That was my door. And so when you walked through it that door, what Como. happened? I, I, it was in Como, outside Como, and this man was an Italian industrialist, and he had a big printing plant. And so I learned, you know, because Como is at the end of the Silk Road, right? It comes from China, it goes all across. And then it's in Como, and then in Como there are all these companies that make silk. And then they they weave, but more than weaving, they print. And so I learned, I, I learned, I was just watching this man, you know, buying illustration, buying paintings, because, because it was a big, huge industry. There were all these talented, um, you know, illustrators or painters that they would sell their art in order to make. And so I learned about that. And in those factories, the workers, they weren't really workers, they were artisans. The colorists, their father was a colorist, their grandfather was a colorist. So from them, without even knowing, I learned about color palette and how you make a color palette and, and how you balance the colors and, and all of that. So that was one thing. And then that man bought another factory because he's, he's do, he was doing so well, he was printing all the scarves for Gucci and Ferragamo and all these people. And then he bought another factory because those people went out of business because they used to make silk stockings. And all of a sudden, pantyhose was born. So then nobody wore silk stockings anymore. So they were selling their factory. And so that's why they were they they went bankrupt. That's right. right. So they they he bought the factory for the walls, but once he got in there, there were all these machines that were making tubular knitting, and he thought, oh, why do I throw this machine? Maybe we could do something else with this machine, and so he called in all the yarn. Dupont and Znia Viscalzi, all these people who, who do yarns. And, and, uh, and we went for thicker yarn than those silk stockings. And that's how the jersey was, was born. He invented this incredible, this jersey. And, uh, because at the t and then it was just at the time that T-shirts, no women would ever wear a T-shirt until in Saint-Tropez, there was a little shop on the Saint-Tropez port called Shows. That little shop, they made colorful T-shirts, red, and because before T-shirts were underwear for sailors. And so they made, and then they, they printed, you know, Shows with an anchor, and Brigitte Bardot started to wear T-shirts. And that was the beginning of T-shirts. So printing, and then jersey, and then he bought another factory with thin needles, whatever. He started to make T-shirts that were, and then printed on the T-shirts. And so that was the beginning. So then I go to 
My, I, I, I had a boyfriend who I met in college, and he, Egon Furstenberg, and he was a prince, and he was good looking, and he was rich because his mother was Agnelli, and he was in America doing a training program. Sure. And he was my boyfriend. And so my mother gave me, for my birthday, a ticket to go and visit him. So there I go to New York for the first time to visit this very good-looking prince that every girl in America wants to marry. And so they weren't that happy that I came about, but the, there were all these new, young designers in New York, Holston, Giorgio Santangelo, um, Stephen Burrow, Scott Berry, that, that whole school. And I had never seen fashion like that because in England was Carnaby Street, in in Paris was still very bourgeois, and Rive, Rive Gauche Saint Laurent had just started, and I don't think Kenzo existed yet. Anyway, so of course those people wanted to dress me because I was the girlfriend of this very illegible bachelor. So I went in the back in their showroom and they would give me clothes. And, and those clothes, especially, especially Giorgio Santangelo, it was all Jersey and it was all very sexy. And it, Stephen Burrows and Giorgio Santangelo, those were the one, body suits, I mean, and um, Stephen Burrows mostly, and uh, Jersey. And so then when I went back, uh, you know, I, so I stayed there for a month or a month and a half, then I went back and I really wanted to find a way, how do I get back to New York? And so when I got back to that factory, all of a sudden I looked at that factory as a completely different way, as an incredible opportunity for me to make, maybe I could make a few samples that I would then sell in America. Mm. And that led to the iconic well, wrap so, dress. Uh, well, and then of course, I, then Egon came back and... and uh, he went to, we, we got engaged, and then he went to Asia. And then while I was in Asia, I realized I was pregnant. So all of a sudden, oh, my God, what is happening to me? And so he said, well, we'll get married right away, organized wedding mid-July. And so I thought, okay. So I went to this man that I was working for, and I said, listen. What I, was his name, by the way? Angelo that? Ferretti. Okay. And I said, I am pregnant. I am getting married and I'm moving to New York. Will you please, please, please allow me to make some clothes that I will try to sell in America? And so I would stay late at night with a pattern maker and grab any fabric that was on the floor, leftovers, and that's how I made my first dresses. So this wrap dress is a really important part of your story because it becomes this like, iconic item but what was the moment that you actually created it like how did that actually happen well it started with a little top a little wrap top first i did t-shirt dresses yeah. and shirt dresses and then there was i found this little wrap oh i had i don't remember there was a wrap top like a baller what ballerinas wore, wear yeah. to keep warm yeah and so i did this wrap top but it had kind of a Catherine Hepburn feeling. It had a big collar and big cuffs and dolman sleeve and very wide band. And I liked the attitude of it. And so I made a, uh, I made a matching skirt. It had pleated in the front, matching skirt. And that was first a two-piece. And it did really well. I sold it. I Where did so you sell it? I sold I, that one, I think I sold that. Sold at Bloomingdale's, at Lord and Taylor, and they did really well immediately. And so I, when I went back, I said, let's try to do that as a dress. And it wasn't that easy because the belt was very wide, and 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 I wanted the skirt to be with godets, and so we worked really hard at make at turning into a dress, and then it became that dress. Did you know from the beginning no. that that dress would have so much potential? <laughs> no. I had no, no. I knew it was a good dress because it had, it had an attitude. But, I mean, did I know that I would sell more than 10 millions of it? No. 
you know, it's funny because, and then that dress was an instant success. And the first one was a leopard print. No, first was a wood print, and then a leopard print, and a snake print, and then all these incredible geometric prints that some I bought, you know, you buy little pieces there in Como, and some I just designed. And then it became... It just became so natural. I learned how to make these prints that that have a way of moving just like they do in nature, just like bark or spots on a leopard or whatever. It's about movement, really. And um, that's it. This podcast is delivered by DHL. As the logistics partner of many of fashion's biggest and most prestigious businesses, DHL is stitched into the fabric of the $2.4 trillion industry. Now present in more than 220 countries and territories, DHL has decades of expertise in logistics and is the world's leading partner for the fashion, jewelry, and lifestyle industries, delivering over 1 billion parcels each year. Drawing on its entrepreneurial expertise, DHL offers tailored logistic solutions suitable for any fashion business, from emerging designers to established global mega brands to independent stores, e-commerce giants, and direct-to-consumer startups. For more information about DHL, visit DHL.com. Just to summarize where we're at so far, you're shaped by this very strong character of your mother and the experience she lived through. You have this huge drive that comes from within you to like meet these expectations. And also, yes, because I was pregnant of this very rich guy and I didn't want people to think that I had made it on purpose. Right, you always wanted to be an independent, self-sufficient woman. All of these things are driving you. This opportunity kind of in a way, magically appears that you get exposed to this factory and you spend time in America and you spot a commercial opportunity and you you play things around. But then comes the hard part, right? Then comes the hard part. It's like to sell 10 million dresses. No, but the hard part wasn't for me, wasn't at the beginning at all. I mean... So let's talk about the beginning first, though. Right. So how do you get to selling millions of dresses? (laughs) It was, it's so strange. I mean, like uh, in 1974, I think that dress, I, that's when I showed that dress for the first time, 73. So maybe I showed it in 73, but it came out in 74. And it immediately took off. And I had this factory. This that, guy, Angelo Ferretti, must have been very happy with you creating oh, so much. I, that we, and, yeah. we went within, within less than two years, we were making 25,000 dresses a week. Wow. 50,000 sleeves. I mean, how do you go from zero dresses to 25,000 dresses? There that, has to be a challenge in that, Deanna. No, they, that, that wasn't my challenge. The first huge problem that I had was a few years later because I had a salesman who didn't want to diversify. Oh, my God, we had the gold goose, right? The dress. Yes, but that one... And so, and the and the manufacturer who also didn't want to diversify. I knew I had to do different thing than just that one dress, but it was so good and it was so successful. So that's all they wanted to do. And every woman in America had one, two, three, five, sometimes twenty. At some point, there had to be a saturation. And so, I would say four years later. I mean, 1978, 79, after I had sold all these incredible dresses, is from one day to the next, on a Sunday morning in snowy. At the time, you know, you opened the New York Times at every major store. I mean, and we had many then. You had Barnwood Teller and Best and Company and Bloomingdale's and Lord and & Taylor and Bergdorf Goodman. I mean, there were many of them. And everyone ran an ad and uh, with a discount ad because they all had so many. They had too many dresses. And then Women's Wear published something like, I don't remember what they say, but 
is it the end of a trend, right? I mean, clearly, because it had been, it had been such a smashy thing that to see that, you know, <gasps> and I'm here 28 years old with all of a sudden this huge thing in my middle of my stomach. I had all of a sudden I had, I don't know, two, three million dollars of inventory. And so I was, I was terrified. What, do, what, what now? So what now? What did you do? So, well, you know, originally when I had started at the beginning, the first two years, I was battling like to sell. Tw- my orders were twenty-five pieces, seventeen pieces, and I would go to the factory and they said, "We can't sell that. I mean, these are not orders. We are a factory. We need big orders." And then he got the big order. So originally, before he got the big order, even before I think the wrap dress was born, I wanted to be like the division of a large manuf- of a large firm. And I went to see a few, but they looked at my clothes and they said, "This will never be commercial. This doesn't. This is only for a few boutiques, special. They, they won't sell in great quantity." But it did. So those same people at the beginning, like in 1973 or something, didn't want to have anything to do with me. Now I had, you know, four years later, I have a big, big thing. I have 17 licenses. I mean, I'm, I mean you wouldn't believe how much I did in, 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 in four or five years. So then I found a company, of another flamboyant man, but this time he was not Italian, he was... American, it's his Andrew Rosen's father. Oh, really? And Carl Rosen, and he had a company, and he had just come up with Calvin Klein jeans, and so he had Calvin Klein jeans, and now he got the Diana Persenberg dresses. So he took over, bought my inventory, took over my inventory, and continued and built it into a business. And then were you still involved, or? And so I wasn't really involved, although I did help them. They Instead of selling, you know, making the clothes in Italy, they made it in Asia. They stopped the jersey. It was all woven. But I did, at the beginning, teach them the whole the printing business, which they had no idea what to do and how to do. And, and, but by then, I had started a cosmetic business. So you and st- I had decided I was going to become Estee Lauder because I had been exposed to work with women and personal appearances. And I mean, I, I was on a huge high. And so I thought I could sell other things, which I did very successfully. So effectively, did you sell your business to Mr. Rosen? I or? licensed it. You licensed it. Okay. So you go, you move into the beauty business. You're kind of not actively involved really anymore in this other business. And then somehow you came back to the business again. No, no, but then I build the cosmetic business. Okay, so you build the cosmetic I business. I build the cosmetic business into, again, in five years into something. I had the hottest makeup line in the world. And look, everybody wanted to buy me, and I and I was very arrogant with my youth and with my success, and I, you know, and I had so much fun doing that because I came up with all the great names, the stop traffic reds and the hot passion pinks. And it was really really fun, and I went around and doing makeup on women. I felt like I was a rock star on tour, and. Then one day, I, what I hadn't realized is in order to build this business, we had borrowed money from the bank. I had not realized it. And then one day the banker said, well, you know, the cash flow was a little bit, and he said, uh, we would like you to sign your personal guarantee, you know, to guarantee the loan. And that scared me. I mean, I said, what do you mean? I mean, you know, my children, my country house and all that. I cannot give you a personal guarantee. And I remember the conversation with the banker and the banker said, I said, well, do you want me to sell the company? And, and I remember he said, well, if you can. <laughs> and uh, I said, but I do, I can. And, I, and then I sold the company to Beecham. Beecham? The, you know, Beach and Powder, the yeah. pharmaceutical, the British pharmaceutical company that had decided that they wanted to go into cosmetics. 
So they bought other brands. They bought Germain Monte and they bought um, Lancaster and they bought Diane Rufusenberg. And actually, after they bought, they decided that you know the, the the chairman got fired, and decided they didn't want to do it. But that's that's the story. So basically, after that, once I sold the cosmetic company, I basically didn't have anything to do with anything else. And I still was collecting a lot of royalties because all of them had turned into licenses. My children by then are in high school. I mean, going uh, high school high school so they're teenagers so when your children are teenagers they love you but they don't like you and you don't like them either <laughs> they went to boarding school I fell in love with a, an, a European writer it was also the time that the Euro- European the Europe was born with a European flag and in, the, in America there was Reagan and I didn't like that so I thought you know what I'm going to Europe. And uh, my children went to boarding school, and I went to Paris. And in Paris, for the next five years, I started a publishing house, which was my other fantasy in life, to have a publishing house. And I translated a lot of... um, I translated books like American Psycho and things like that. And I lived with a writer, and I had a fantasy to have a, a literary... Salon and Alberto Moravia lived with us, so I lived that fantasy, a left bank apartment, a literary salon, publishing house, blah, blah, blah. And then? And then, and then, the love affair was less interesting, and I missed America, and so I went back to America, and then was the time that I had the hardest time. Because I come back to America, but I have lost my identity. I left America, and I was a big shot, the wunderkind, the da 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 On the cover of Newsweek, all that stuff. On the cover of Wall Street Journal, all that. I interview everything. And then I come back, and I'm a little bit of a has-been, and I completely had left the world of fashion completely. And, you know, because and it was the 80s and big shoulder pads and big hair, and I didn't like any of that. So I come back to America, and I've lost my identity, and the, the, the stuff that goes under my name is awful, and on discount stores, and, and awful, and every license does something different, and that was really hard, and I tried to meet with them, and you know, show them bo- bo- mood board and this, and they look at me like, um, who is she? And I had a hard time. As a matter of fact, a few years later, I got a cancer of the base of my tongue. And I think that the cancer came from not being able to express myself. So, but... I, one day, there was a man called Marvin Traub, you know, yes, Marvin, of course. Traub. I remember Marvin, Marvin Traub, Marvin Traub, who had been the chairman of Bloomingdale's, of right. Bloomingdale's, by now he's no longer the chairman of Bloomingdale's, but he has a consultant company, uh, but he was an extraordinary, I mean, he tre- Bloomingdale's at the time was like big show business, you know, they would do promotion of India, and the whole store was Indian, and or Michael, Gr- I mean, they, it, Antonio worked for them, the illustrator, I mean, it was extraordinary. So one day Marvin Traub said, you know, your name could be the biggest name in year 2000. I said, why? Anyway, so it was him and somebody else called, oh, I forget his name. Anyway, and so one Saturday in 1992, we go with his two partners and we take the Metro Liner and we go to Philadelphia and we walk into this company called QVC. And QVC was a company for selling on television. Quality, value, Convenience, that's what QVC stands for. And there we walk in, and it was like a TV studio. And in the middle of the studio is this woman, Susan Lucci. She was a soap opera singer. Oh, yeah, from All My Children. That's right. And she is selling shampoo. 
and within hours, she's selling hundreds of thousands of shampoo. So all of us are just amazed. And I, that I remember saying to myself, I want to buy, I want to own this place because I thought it was such an amazing idea because I had done personal appearance. I built my career doing personal appearance. So this is a personal appearance on a national level. Anyway, they were very interested in doing something with me. I thought I would do cosmetics, but they wanted to do clothes. Clothes on television, it was very, very, very tacky. So I said, how can I do clothes on television in this tacky channel? But no one had offered me anything in a long time. So I said, well, let me think about, because, I mean, how can you buy television, you know, clothes on television without trying and that doesn't make sense. So I went, this time I went to Hong Kong and I went to these printing factories that I had, that, that uh, Carl Rosen had introduced me to. And when I left this man in, in Hong Kong, he was a little factory and I, I was a big, big shot. And this time I'm a little person, he has become a big shot. And I say, listen, I have this idea of coming up with this thing. I had named it Silk Assets. And it was all about silks. And it was starting with scarves, right? You'd be a scarf with a story. And then from the scarf, let's say the first one was Pietra Dura. And it came from, you know, the Pietra Dura from Florence. And the marble, you know. And uh, Pietra Dura, and then you would have the scarf, and then you have a big shirt, and then you would have uh, pull-on pants and no dresses, just, you know, and, and it would be the, the color palette, and I mean, it's just, you know, and, you were allowed, and one print. Your licensing deal allowed you to still do a clothing business that was competing, potentially? Y yes, I don't, I, I don't know where I was. I was definitely allowed to do that. I guess maybe I wasn't doing that anymore. I don't know. I get out. And so I did that. And no, so I made this few samples, and I remember the one thing I didn't want to do anymore is I didn't want to own inventory. So I came up with this genius idea. I went to QVC and I said, listen, I will design, I will source, and I will make sure you get it on time. But you buy it directly from the factory and you own it. And I will take 25% on top of cost. And that was the best deal. And so we went in, so we ordered the goods and this and that. Meanwhile, while this is happening, my ex-lover, who by then is my best friend, Barry Diller, had resigned from, had left Fox, where he was the chairman, and he was looking for something to do. And I told him about QVC, and he had heard about it, and by the time I went to QVC to do my first show, by the way, we sold in two hours a million three hundred thousand dollars. And by the time I had done the first show, Barry was already negotiating to take over the company. So all of a sudden I went from being a complete has been to be a total pioneer again. Wow. Okay. I'm sorry, I have a lot of stories. No, your stories are amazing. This is what it's about drive. So through that whole, all those ups and downs, all those challenges, Dan, what do you think it is about, you know, what's inside you that keeps you going? Because a lot of people would, once there has been, you know, in their head, they can never come back. But I you know. keep coming back. And then back. I did it again. I just want to finish quickly. Yeah. I mean, and then in, in 1998, because QVC was a big success, but I knew that that's not what I wanted to do. And then I started noticing that the young hip girls were buying the old dresses. The wrap the, dresses. The, the, but the, the wrap dresses, the jersey dresses in vintage shops. And then I started again. So you went back, and did you buy the licenses back then? Yeah. Well, some I didn't even need to buy. I just okay. got them. Okay. And, uh, and then I started again in 98. And before, before I thought I was, again, I was so obsessed with not having inventory. And by then, all the department stores, they all merged together. There were only few department stores left, and they were all called Federated Department oh, Stores, yes. which then became Macy's. Macy's. And I went to the chairman, and we had breakfast, and I said, listen, 
I make a deal with you. I will be your private label. I will do, we can do fashion, we can do home, we can do beauty. But I will, I will have a design studio, I will design, I will source, but you buy it, the same thing. Again, no inventory. Again, yeah. yeah. And he said, great. And we started to negotiate, and this, and then he quit. I, so, no, but he, he, he negotiated, and then I said, but because you're going to spend a lot of money, this is what I'm going to do. I am going to buy, uh, I, I bought a, uh, a carriage house on West 12th Street in the middle of butchers and drag queen clubs, and everybody thought I was crazy. And I bought that, and I said, that's going to be my design studio and showroom, and then the buyers will come. And So I really started to do that, and then all of a sudden he quit, and the next person, Terry Lundgren, said, out. I don't want it. So I was stuck. So Rosemary Bravo, who was the president of Saks, she said, I want your dresses back, and then uh, that's how I started, but with inventory. Anyway, so that's just so that you know how I got the, the third time, the second time, that's how I started again, and then I built a huge business again. And uh, so the question was, how do you go on at the time that you're down? First of all, the, the, the thing that is most in, most interesting for people to know is that when everybody thinks you are at the very top and people cheer you and they think you're so successful, you yourself may know that you, something is not, it's not so as nice and as goldy as it looks, right? That's on the way up. But the same thing when people turn, you know, when think you are nobody, you also know wait a minute, I know I can go back, you know, because you know. So I think that's, for people, that's the most useful information to have, is that when you are your top, you may not really be at your top. But the same thing, when you're at the very bottom, you're not really at the very bottom. You know, this is, it reminds me of the philosophy that I learned in, in a form of Buddhist meditation, which basically says that when things are going very, very well, don't crave or get kind of, don't believe your own hype. That's right. And when things are going not so well, don't That's right. reject That's it. Right. You know, just try to remain equanimous right. through That's it right. all. But I think it's important for people to know that because yeah. people look at, it's like being happy. I mean, okay, happiness, you're happy and then you cross the street, you got run over by a car. Nothing is ever stagnant and not, nothing is ever Forever, do you know what I mean? Sure, everything so, is impermanent. It's on the yes. So you have to live the moment, and you have to own whatever it is—a catastrophe, anything. Face it, own it, deal with it. Right now, I am going through my third act, which, or whatever. Uh, which yes, no, no. I but but yeah. the point is that right now, or the or let's say the last three, four years yeah. have been again challenging. And difficult yeah. for me because you grow and then what? But also because the world is changing, it's disruptive and all of that. So again, what you have to do is you have to assess what is for you, what is in the world, and take advantage and maybe dare, you know, shrink it a little so that you could be, you could look at the disruption of the world and you can recreate yourself for the new world. Right. And this third act, part of that third act is actually thinking about succession legacy. and like yes, legacy. Yes, and also because I am 71. Yes. So, I mean, you know, I mean, when I, I was so successful, so young, that I was sure that I would retire by the time I was 30. And now 40 years later, I'm still doing this. I mean, this is ridiculous, right? So, yes. So now is, and, and, and will you believe, if people say, people always ask you, if you knew then what you know now, what would you do different, right? And I always thought that was the most annoying question because I always didn't have an answer. Now I do have an answer. Okay. I never did a business plan. I am now, today, this 
in the ne- you know in the, in the in the last six months or so, for the first time, I actually sat down myself with a pathetic, lo- big, huge piece of of paper, and I started to list all the assets. What is this brand that I created? Yes, it is global, and yes, it is that. But what is it? What is it that is distinguishable about it? What is it that is unique? Because what is unique is what matters, right? Yes. So I have an iconic product, the wrap dress. I have a vocabulary of an archive of 10,000 prints. And over the years, I have this emotional connection that I have had with four generations of women, four or maybe even more. And those are my assets, you see what I mean? And then you say, okay, but what does the brand stand for? What does it mean? You know, I wanted to be a woman in charge. The DVF woman is the woman in charge. And so the, the DVF, the brand, is supposed to service this, this woman to give her the tools to be the woman she wants to be. So it's all about function. It's all about practical. But yet she wants to be stylish. Yes, she wants to be beautiful. Yet she, and reassessing the essence of what you are. And now everybody is talking about authentic, and you have to be authentic, and all of that. So right now it's all making sense. Only 40 years later. I know. <laughs> it's an amazing journey. I know. It's crazy, right? Yeah. It's an amazing journey. And I think what's so remarkable is that that original fortitude that was, you said, that was within you even before you were born about making it through, having the psychology to experience. Fear is not an option. Fear is not an option. You're going to be an independent woman. You you're can never be a victim. Exactly. And you're going to rely on yourself That's right. through it all. The most important relationship in life is the one you have with yourself. If you have that, any other relationship is a plus and not a must. And you know, so for me, what I take away is like there are some really practical lessons here. Like maybe you should do a business plan and maybe you should think about inventory and managing inventory <laughs> properly, which are really important right. lessons. But also, that actually a big part of being an entrepreneur, a big part of building a business is actually having the right mindset and psychology to kind of go through it all with a, 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 like a, an understanding yourself through that process. It's, it's all got to do with staying close to yourself and not look at competition and not look at other people and just but it's not easy it's not easy it doesn't come necessarily that easy it does the at the beginning that first juice but then you know that first juice gets diluted and then you listen to this one and that one and but i have no answer after all of that i have no answer well there's, i mean i think that's the thing too it's like you always have as the journey continues, there's more and more questions, right? And you're still right. asking yourself questions now. Totally. And you still wake up in the morning, feel like a total loser. Not every day, but sometimes. And then you have to remember that, this is the most helpful thing, when you doubt your power, you give powers to your doubts. Well, on that note, Diane von Furstenberg, icon, and Oracle, <laughs> living legend. Thank you for sharing Thank you. your story of drive with us. It's, um, it's a really inspirational one. Thank and I'm you. sure for everybody that's listening, there's lots of lessons to take away there. On But the most important, dare to be you, dare to believe in what you believe, and own it. Okay. And on that note, I will bid you all farewell. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very so much. much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Drive, delivered by DHL where we hear stories of entrepreneurship. If you've enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe to hear more episodes and give us a rating and email us at podcast at businessoffashion.com with any questions or guest suggestions. To learn more about BOF, click on the description notes in this episode. If you've enjoyed this conversation, you might also be interested in BOF Professional, our global membership community which keeps you up to date with everything you need to know about the global fashion industry. 
For a limited time only, we are offering our BOF podcast listeners an exclusive 25% discount on an annual BOF professional membership. So to get 25% off your first year of a BOF professional membership, click on the link in the episode notes, select the annual package, and enter the special discount code PODCAST2018 at checkout.